weeks, we have been looking at passages in the last book of the Bible, Revelation. Now, that book tends to scare people. And maybe you thought, well, why is the pastor preaching on Revelation? Makes me all scared. Well, it's actually a new discovery for all of us to realize that these words are written for our encouragement. Not to scare us, but to encourage us. I find that a marvelous thing. And questions have already been answered in some of the sermons that you heard or at least can hear still on the YouTube. Who's in charge? Well, not a typical lion figure roaring around, but a lamb. <laughs> That's the first surprise that John had, is that the salvation comes not from the roaring lion, but the lamb that is slaughtered is worthy. And he's more worthy than the Caesars of the time in which John lived. Worthy is the Lamb, not worthy is Caesar. And that could be something we need to think of a lot in our world today. So that's one question. Who's in charge? The Lamb. Who can survive all of the conflict on the planet is another question. And we've discovered it's the Christians who have come through all of the challenges and remain standing. Now it's not that all challenges are removed. It's not like all difficulties are taken away, but Christians are given the grit, I would say, and the grace to go through things and remain standing. Who conquers all of the evil so that others can remain standing is another question. And we discovered that all those horses that march through the apocalypse, one horse is white. And on that one white horse is the Messiah, the Christ, who rides into the evil places where all these other horses are trampling on the earth, and he finally brings a victory. So there is a way through all of the difficulties, even on this world tonight, we're not left alone without help. The Christ engages the worst evil can offer and conquers it. That should make us happy. So we find ourselves tonight at nearly the end of the story, the great climax, and I'd like to read from Revelation 21, verses 10, and then going from 22 through chapter 22, 5. Hear the word that John received from the Spirit. So he took me in the spirit to a great high mountain, and he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. I saw no temple in the city, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no need of sun or moon, for the glory of God illuminates the city, and the Lamb is its light. The nations will walk in its light, and the kings of the world will enter the city in all of their glory, and its gates will never be closed at the end of the day because there's no night there. And all the nations will bring their glory and honor into the city. Nothing evil will be allowed to enter, nor anyone who practices shameful idolatry and dishonesty, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Then the angel showed me a river with the water of life clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. It flowed down the center of the main street. On each side of the river grew a tree of life bearing twelve crops of fruit with a fresh crop each month. The leaves were used for medicine to heal the nations. No longer will there be a curse upon anything, for the throne of God and of the Lamb will be there, and his servants will worship him, and they will see his face, and his name will be written on their foreheads, and there will be no night there, no need for lamps or sun, for the Lord God will shine on them, and they will reign forever and ever. And all the people say, Amen. Amen. That sounds good to me.
I'm kind of ready for that kind of a world, aren't you? Yes. John receives this additional vision from the Spirit, and I think it's interesting that there's beauty and blessing that lies ahead. Beauty and blessing. We need to remember these two words in our time where we sometimes see things ugly and cursed all around us. The promise is for beauty and blessing. I think that's wonderful in itself. Struggles and conflict once again do not have the last word. The destruction we see in our current world and it disturbs us so much will not have the last word and I'm so glad about that. After all of the empires of this world crumble and fall, God opens the way for a new urban environment. Did you notice it's a new city? It's not going back as such to the Garden of Eden, but it's a new city. We've become urbanites. And so God restores us to a city. God has a way through our current world of conflict and mess to bring us a future. I think that's wonderful. It should encourage us tonight. There is a future. There's a future for all these kids. There's a future for Johan. There's a future here. Yeah. yeah, and we need to remind our kids that as ugly as this world can be at times, there is a future for them. And I'm, I'm really convinced of that. I have two grandsons, and I want them to always know there's a future for them. All of the mess we have developed as a human family is resolved here into something new and good because we have a good God. We cannot simply live as we choose without consequences, so some of the pictures and images of Revelation tend to reveal how complicated the consequences of our false living can become. And that's where we get a little bit afraid when we read those chapters, we think, oh man, is that really going to happen? Is that going to happen to me? Are we going to go through that? Well, what is John trying to say? It says, he's trying to say, that when we live, we bring consequences into our lives and into the world we're living in. And so the human family right now, and I say human family because we're all part of one big family, we're suffering the consequences of how the human family has lived in the time prior to our arrival. I was thinking about that in some very conscious ways because in the time frame when I was growing up, things were a lot different even in the natural world than it is now. And that's only in my lifetime. And I think, what have we done to muck it up so badly for this generation? And we have to say we did a lot of muck up. And therefore, we are suffering consequences of our mucking up. And Revelation describes how torn up things are. So when you read some of those chapters, you're thinking, oh no, oh no, really? And we have to say, yeah. There's a lot of stuff that is coming as consequences of how we've been living. And yet, and yet, in God so loved the world, remember John 3, 16, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. In this verse, God so loved the world is the clue to the world's future. God does not abandon the world he's created. It's not like I created the world, you mucked it up, and I'm gone. Now, sometimes that's how we are as human beings. You mucked it up, I'm out of here. Have fun fixing that. God, thankfully, is not like that. Isn't that good news? You should be getting happier tonight. It's good news that God has not abandoned us. He will continue to love us. And Jesus, who becomes the Lamb for the world, works together with his Father, the God Almighty, in restoring and recreating everything in a new location. We're given the scope 
of this renewal in this text. So here's what I think. There's no need for buildings in which to worship. It says there's no temple buildings there. Now that's an interesting thing we could ponder about. And I'm not sure if we can take the picture too far. But God and the Lamb will be recognized by all as the one to worship. All other differences that we try to make with, there's buildings over here for this group's worshiping, and this group is worshiping over here, and this one is over here, that's all going to be eliminated. Why? Because God and the Lamb are there, and everybody says, oh, they're the ones to be worshipped. And all of these other buildings that imply divisions and differences and who's right and who's wrong will melt away. Even treasured theological differences apparently don't matter. I think that's marvelous. Human beings tend to hang on to their ideas as if they're always right. And I think God says he's right and we need to get on with it here together and enter his space instead of not thinking we understand all and want people to enter our space. We have to think about that, I think. Arrogance in these things are still at work in our world, but division, even on religious things, won't last forever. The ones arriving in this city will be in relationship with the ones in charge of the city, and I think that's the clue. They will be in right relatedness with the God Almighty and the Lamb who are united. And all whose hearts have been transformed will be enabled to focus together on who is the Lord. And out of this flow of worshiping together, there will come some interesting things. One thing, there will be a solution to the energy problems. Did you catch that? Light becomes organically connected to God and Lamb. Soon we'll be celebrating Pentecost. When the Holy Spirit came, there was a huge amount of energy released. So I'd like to tap into that more. There was dynamite quality there, a rushing wind and fire, and people energized. We are searching these days for alternative energy sources. How will we have enough energy to provide all of us with light and mobility? You know, we're in a crisis. You hear that every day. And we have people frantically trying to find more oil and gas and stuff. And here we find the ultimate energy source for the world. The energy found in this relationship, God plus Lamb, will be enough for all. Isn't that interesting? There will even be no need for the sun or the moon. And this energy is embraced by the world. Did you notice? Nations will walk in its light. Yeah, they finally got it. Kings will enter the city and enjoy the illuminating glory present. And maybe they will add their little bit to this big bite of energy surrounding them. And that also implies the solution to the status question. Every king can lay down his crown, his government, his power upon entering the sea. This major source of conflict, who's the greatest, is eliminated at the door. I find that marvelous. It's resolved. Everyone gets it at the end. Our human power is so small in comparison with the almighty. The almighty power of the one who fully illuminates everything. I don't know if you found fascinating this big dark hole, the picture that they have. Now, it's surrounded by energy. It's fascinating. I don't get it. You know, I, I couldn't explain it to you what it means, but it's interesting to look at and when you think of all of these energies out there then imagine the energy of the one who created all of these things will be 
unbelievably powerful to provide for us all. And then there'll be no night. There's permanent daylight time. No closing down. Usually cities close down in the evening because all kinds of dangers come in the night. I arrived at the Hauptbahnhof yesterday evening around 9 plus o'clock, coming back from a, a pleasant trip, but arriving in the Hauptbahnhof these days was not wonderful, to say it mildly. It was, you have to fight your way to where you want to be and go. It's a long journey these days. Plus, there were lines of police in their really hefty outfits at the end of where we got off of the train. I kept thinking, what is going on here? It was spooky, actually. I was so glad to get out of town. I thought, what in the world is going on? Well, can you get the feel of these kind of things? I remember when we lived in North Philadelphia after we had gotten married, Alfred and I lived in North Philadelphia, and believe me, you didn't go out at night and take a walk to the area, the neighborhood. It was too dangerous. We used to invite people over to our apartment from the church and say, come now, and they used to say to us, is it safe to drive to North Philadelphia? And we used to say, well, we live there. <laughs> so you can come for a visit. Spooky places in big cities. And you just never went out for walks because it was dangerous. Well, don't you feel in this text that there's a freeing sense in these words? Its gates will never be closed. Nothing evil will be allowed to enter. Wow. What a wonderful thing. Finally, a safe place to be. You can walk around everywhere at any time in safety. For there's no more dishonesty, lying, and no more idolatry, false orientation in this city. And your name is registered. I wanted to tell Johan, and you can pass it on to him. His name is registered in the Lamb's Book of Life. Yeah? His name is there, written, Johan. You're registered, and you can enter the city without a problem. Religious conflicts are over, the energy crisis is resolved, security issues are eliminated, and then the water and food crisis are addressed. There is a river, and in the flow of this beautiful river, two things are observed. The water is crystal clear, no pollution. I think that's exciting. I remember as a kid, we used to go for walks in some of the air, valley area around where I grew up, and you could actually drink some of the water coming down from the mountainside. And you don't just do that anywhere anymore. And I don't even know if you can do that in Minnesota anymore. Simply because pollution has mucked up a lot of the water systems. But here, no pollution, water crystal clear. Isn't that beautiful? It brings me great joy to consider that there will be pure drinking water and available in large quantities. And it is flowing from a good source. I remember growing up in Minnesota that in Lake Itasca was the source of the Mississippi River in a little place. And then it kept flowing and flowing and flowing until it became a huge body of water going all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. This flowing from a good source, this water, this river here comes from God and the Lamb. And all necessary ingredients for creative work are found there in that source. And again, there's abundance. Abundance of creative, beautiful energy flowing in this river. It's not just a trickle of water. It's a flowing river. There's energy and enough water for everyone, and there's no fighting over water rights. What a wonderful thing. Because that's the next thing on our planet, of course. People are going to be fighting for water. Why? We see drought everywhere. I saw just in the news, Netherlands, dry, dry. We're dry around here. There's other places, Christopher said today. In Boston area, for some of the first time in the Blue Hills, there's more threatening nature of fire. 
So here we are on this planet, drying up, and we can look towards a time where there's flowing river. I like that. I like that. And that's at the end of the day, all unanswered questions, even about baptism, like who is the right one to get into the pool, questions, will be washed away in this river. Pure water is found here, which means that wherever that water flows, crops are healthy. A tree of life is on each side of the river, and the vegetarians here seem to have won the day. For the true trees give life, and twelve crops of fruit, fresh each month, are produced for all. I think it's going to be delightful to eat whatever that fruit is, don't you think so? Magnificent fruit, and there's going to be enough for the entire year, and there'll be enough for the entire world. Everyone will be satisfied and, did you catch it, nourished. Not just fit. You can feed people a piece of bread so they're not so hungry, but does that really nourish them? God is interested in our wholeness, our completeness, being nurtured and nourished so that we can really be creatively active in his kingdom. And what's even more refreshing, I think, is that the leaves of these marvelous trees will provide medicine to heal the nations. It's astonishing to me, but should that surprise us? Jesus, in his activity while he was here on earth, what did he do? He healed people. Sometimes he spoke words to them that restored them. Sometimes he touched them and that restored them. But whatever method or moment, there was this transforming action of Jesus that raised people back to health. A power was there, as some of the New Testament says. And so here at a cosmic level, with the Creator in charge, nations are touched. Nations are touched with healing. John and Linda, Nigeria is going to be touched someday by this God who wants to heal your nation. Yeah. God is interested, you see, in the whole world. All of our communities are of interest to God. And we're aware of how sick our world is right now, how sick nationalism is with all of its pride and arrogance, or other ideologies like white supremacy ideology. The guy, the young fellow in Buffalo, New York, figuring out how to go there to find the concentration of the population he hated so he could shoot them. What is this? Evil? It's evil. Distortion of thought. And you ask yourself, how can such minds and hearts be healed? They need leaves from these trees that God's going to provide. We see how senseless and sick many things are, and the nations need to be healed of all of these divisive thoughts and dangerous ideologies. How can a new way be found so that people can just embrace one another and let one another be? I've read some articles and I could add things on here, but it doesn't necessarily help us all. You read about all these silly divisions and you think, could you please just let one another be and embrace one another as human beings and then dialogue about what's going on with one another? How can we embrace one another? Well, here we find an answer. What seems impossible from the human point of view is not impossible from God's point of view. He has a tree of life medicine which can heal the nations. The world that God created has the healing remedy within it. There's some natural things that God has put into the universe. And when he's in charge, it can be released to heal. What joy, I think, there is for us to know that these things can be healed. They're not impossible. They're not impossible. And the final thing, to sum it all up, is there will be no curse found in this new city. No curse on anything. Isn't this refreshing? 
There's no curses left, not even the curses people throw at each other. And we have that in our society, people curse each other. You are, they're always ready to bite on somebody. That's going to be gone. And if you read these verses, you feel a blessing through the words being used, illuminating light, no temple fights, no evil lies but honesty, no shut doors, no fear, a flowing river, a tree of life, fresh fruit, healing leaves. This sounds like a blessing to me. And imagine all of the negative effects of cursing are gone. Everyone who knows God and is present will see his face and God will shine on them. And this is not temporary, it's forever. Despite, therefore, all of the current things that we're going through in our world, with all the evil we see presented to us every day, we can look forward with hope to a time when everything will be reordered, refreshed, and made new. We live out of that hope even now. That keeps me going. It can keep us going. And what can we do in this in-between time? Get registered. Sign up with Jesus. That may sound simple, but it's not. But let's get ourselves registered in the Lamb's Book of Life. Let Him already become our source of life. And then we can join in the kingdom that He is building even now amongst us. And we can help bring it to completion when He makes everything fresh and new. Well, I hope that encourages you tonight and gives you a sense of perspective. We have a promise and a hope. Even in the midst of the crazy world we're in right now, the Lord has given us hope. And all the people said together, Amen. Amen. Amen.